This is a Guide Your Light Network production, creating podcasts with purpose. And so I have actually been reflecting a lot about this and, and one, getting a bit more balance in my life, but two, what people would say and how confronting that is. You know, do you want people to say like, gosh, she was incredibly driven and she was an amazing business person? Like, probably not. Like, it's probably not the things that I would want to be the first thing that that rolls off her tongue. Welcome to the Things You Can't Unhear podcast. I'm your host, Maritza Barone. Get ready to hear moments that will help you to see the world differently and inspire you to become the happiest, healthiest, and kindest version of you. Hello, and welcome back to Things You Can't Unhear, my friends. Thank you for clicking play. Today on the show, we welcome Taryn Williams. She's a true powerhouse and disruptor at the intersection of the talent media and tech industries. She's got over 20 years experience in business, cementing her status as one of Australia's most celebrated entrepreneurs. At just 21 years old, Taryn built and founded Wink Models, which has gone on to become one of the country's most successful modeling agencies. She's also the founder of the well-known talent platform, The Right Fit, which connects talent with brands, as well as several other successful businesses. Plus her latest venture, Hash Gifted, which is revolutionizing influencer marketing and has already been embraced by major brands. In this episode today, we explore Taryn's inspiring journey, discovering the mindset required to thrive as an entrepreneur, as well as the personal sacrifices she has had to make along the way. In true things you can't unhear style, we'll get personal with Taryn as we dive into some conscious questions that allow us to see her and understand her on a deeper level. Definitely got her thinking towards the end of this episode, so make sure you stay tuned for that part. Now, this episode is for you. If you are curious about the secrets behind building successful business and disrupting markets, if you want to learn why it's important to become a master of your niche and why it's important to surround yourself with a network that supports you professionally and emotionally and so much more. I feel like it's really important to learn from the experiences that entrepreneurs go through. There's so much we can take away and implement into our own lives, even if we are not business owners or entrepreneurs ourselves. So I'm sure you will love the wisdom and insights of Taryn Williams as much as I did. Now, if you love this show and tune in regularly, I would love you to help the show continue to grow, making our fifth year bigger, better and bolder. So if you can, please rate and review things you can't unhear on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or whatever listening platform you are on right now. Thank you so much. Welcome, Taryn Williams, to the Things You Can't Unhear podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited. Oh, I can't wait to chat to you. I'm really excited as well. And, you know, I've been doing a lot of business coaching the last few years and, and getting deep into the entrepreneurial world, which is really at the at the root of who I am at my heart. But um, I want to know, as a serial entre- entrepreneur that you are and, and the disruptor that you are, how would you define yourself as an entrepreneur? What type of entrepreneur? Because there's so many. You can be that strategist, that numbers person, or you can be that visionary. But what do you define yourself as? Yeah. Look, that's such a great question. I always say I'm really brilliant in businesses zero to two years. Like I love the process of discovery, coming up with a concept, identifying a problem that could be solved and bringing people and resources um, around a problem to solve it. And then I'm done. I'm I'm not interested in in scale in the next phase. I've got a bottom drawer of ideas that I would love to have the time to work on. So I'm sort of, I guess, the ideas person, the problem solver, and then I want to hand over to an executor and an operator to go and do the next part of the journey. That's so brilliant that you know that about yourself. Have you known that about yourself throughout the course of your business Absolutely. journey? Absolutely. <laughs> you do I, now, think, I think it comes with age and skinning your knees a few times and 
really having to tell, I've had amazing mentors in my career as well, I think, which has really helped me figure out the things I'm good at, things that I'm maybe not so great at, um, the things that I'm willing to work on. And I probably, I think, you know, stubbornly, the things that I'm not willing to work on at, you know, at a particular age, um, I'm really, really good at, at, you know, a very specific deep vertical of things. And there's certain things that I don't want to go broader on. So, so that's probably a terrible thing to say, but I think having that, that ability to, to reflect and go, look, do I want to grow in these areas and develop and become better at, I don't know, managing people or, you know, whatever it might be, or do I want to use my time to go really deep into a specific thing that I'm really good at and, you know, sort of solve for those things. So yeah, look, I think it's been, it's definitely been a journey. I think in my first businesses, I wanted to do all of the things and I wanted to touch every element of the business and, you know, be across everything um, before I realized that that was actually the blocker to us scaling. I think once I took a step back and said, you know, what, nor do, I don't really enjoy, you know, these particular elements of the business and it's probably not the best use of my time. If I put people in those elements that are better than me, who really enjoy it, who really thrive at it, it could actually free me up to go and do the things that I'm really good at. So, yeah, I love that answer. And I think it's it's brilliant. And it's obviously worked for you in the, all the business that you've created and exited up to this date now. What you really hone in on is the talent world. So this is this is your niche. Um, tell us about why that excites you. I know you're a former model, probably a current model as well. You've still definitely got the incredible looks. <laughs> oh, yeah, this light's really doing me favors. Yeah, look, I yeah, I, I've just been in the industry for such a long time, and I think it, it's given me this really deep domain expertise and identifying sort of problems and opportunities around that sphere. So you know, whether it's social media, whether it's digital marketing, um, whether it's, yeah, talent, you know, pure talent management, whether it's reaching a little bit more into, um, I guess, aligned industries. So obviously now for me that that's sort of become tech. So obviously I, I started, my first business was a traditional talent agency called Wink Models. Um, and I built a tech platform to manage that business. Um, and that was sort of my first foray into tech. And then the right fit, obviously a two-sided marketplace, then into Hash Gifted, the Influencers Agency. So they've all had similar commonalities in being based around talent of all kinds, you know, whether they're speakers or models or influencers or content creators. Um, and I think the uniforming theme, I guess, of the last, you know, five to seven years has really been that that technology piece. How can I create businesses that are more scalable um, and can grow outside of having any sort of key man dependency through using technology. Yeah, it's super exciting what you do because you obviously see holes and opportunities in existing industries and go, what do we need here and how can we create something to make everyone's life easier and more efficient? It's a blessing, it's a blessing and a curse, I always say, because <laughs> yeah. I really have a bottom drawer of ideas that I'm like, and if you ever come to work for me, then you know that you get forced into trying to start a business of your own because I always you know, people, um, are there, I think there's amazing entrepreneurs within organizations. And, you know, I, and one of my engineers at the moment has had a, had built an amazing widget for our website. And, and I was like, oh my God, you know, you should start a business on the side and you can sell this. And this is how the monetary, you know, structure could work. And, and this is how we build out the go-to-market plan. And he was like, yeah, cool. I don't have time to do that. I obviously have a full-time job for you. I'm and working like, for you. There's a yeah, business coach yeah. in you, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> so I do always, I'm like, oh, you should start a business. So I have to accept that not everyone has the, the risk appetite to go and start businesses. So it's a blessing and a curse. I think I, de I definitely identify challenges and, and opportunities in, um, you know, all different sorts of sectors. And then it's just about the pain is in the execution. Like it, it's yeah. very easy to have lots of, lots of, you know, good or great ideas, but actually going and, and executing them and bringing them to life is the painful part. Yeah, you're right. And I am absolutely fascinated. Uh, with the minds of entrepreneurs and, and how they navigate those risk and the, the challenges that they come against and, and also seeing opportunities where other people don't. So I really want you to take us through the Wink story, your, your agency that you launched, because I love this story. And I think there's so much that people can take away from it for their own and, and hearing where you started off with this and, and what opportunities you saw with it. So can you share that story with us, where you were at in your career and what made you find these opportunities? Yeah, absolutely. So I'd been modeling myself since I was about 15 and there was just so many inefficiencies and inequalities in, in the process. Like models didn't get paid for a very long time. Generally, it was about 90 days from when they did a job. And that was purely because 
the client had to pay the advertising agency, the advertising agency had to pay the talent agency, and then the talent agency paid the model. And there was this unwritten rule in the industry that the model didn't get paid until all of those people had been paid, which is kind of insane because it doesn't happen in any other industry where, you know, it doesn't matter if, if my clients pay me at, you know, wink, we still pay our staff, right? Like they get paid fortnightly irrespective of, so I was like, why doesn't that work for models? Like it doesn't happen in any other industry, but it was just this sort of unwritten rule. And there was also this kind of, you know, some of the yucky things that people associate with the with the talent industry, like, you know, a little bit of a rule by fear thing and some negative connotations around body image. And, and so I thought, you know what, I'm going to start an agency that pays everyone on time. We're going to pay weekly and we're going to be like a little family of support around our models. We're going to be the people that they can come to when, you know, they've had a bad breakup or they're going through a big life change. They're getting their, you know, they're graduating from uni, they're moving out of home all of those things. And I wanted it to be built on this, you know, idea of decency and respect and treating each other fairly on both sides of that transaction. I wanted our clients to know that we were an extension of their team. We would go above and beyond for them. You know, they could call us at the last minute and go, oh, I've made a mistake. I forgot to book a model for today. And, you know, it's urgent. Can you help us out? And that we would go, yeah, I'm on it. We'll, we'll solve it. And from the flip side, you know, that our models knew that we would be there for them. We would support them. We would pay them fairly. We would pay them on time. And so that was sort of the initial concept and both sides obviously really got behind that. They could really see what I was trying to build was something that was quite disruptive in the industry and that I was willing to take that risk and say, look, I see that this can be done better and I want both sides to have a really great experience. And if the pain point is the piece in the middle, um, the agency, I can solve that. So that was... 18 years ago now and the business has grown year on year every year for 18 years it's wild to think it's that old you know it could be a, a fully grown adult out in the world by now if it was my I always say it's my first baby and about eight years into that journey I built a tech platform for the business because there was nothing available off the shelf and we were literally doing everything manually which is wild when you think back on it we had 650 models we would email them call sheets. We would text them, hey, you know, your call time's changed by half an hour. They would text us, hey, I finished an hour late. We would raise a new invoice to a client for the overtime. There was just so many opportunities for human error and so many pain points that, you know, if a booker left the agency, we lost all of the history. Everything was maintained in that person's head about which clients like which models. And so I went looking for something off the shelf, like a sort of CRM tool that could manage this plus billings, plus availability checking. And there was nothing there. So I thought, you know, blissful naivety of someone who'd never built a tech product. I was like, I'm going to build something myself. I'm going to, I'm going to build an app and it's going to check availability and it's going to be this super cool, easy thing. And I went out and I did all the things that I thought I should do. I got three quotes from different agencies to build it and compared them and called for references and picked someone. And as you can probably imagine, it was just a completely painful terrible experience and and for no one's fault just in that I'd never built a tech product before so I didn't really know what I was doing and so I was like oh I want to add this feature and I'm going to add that feature and oh you know I built this bigger than Ben Hur system um that cost you know five times as much as it was supposed to cost took three times as long as it was supposed to take you were getting um, your training in that cost oh, right yeah. <laughs> oh yeah I always say it was like an expensive MBA, mm. but I learned so much through the process and it completely transformed that business. And I got to the end of the build and I was like, oh, what I should have done is made this open to our clients. So instead of them having to come to us, they could just post their job into the Wink system and it would check the availabilities of the models, schedule them in, deal with all the invoicing. And it was just around the time that sort of freelancer had started, Airtasker was starting. And so I went to see some of our clients and I said, if I had built this this way, would you use it? Is there an idea here? Like, could I build a marketplace that could streamline these things? Um, and maybe outside of just models, maybe we could have photographers and actors and makeup artists. And that was where the idea for the right fit my next business came from so it's such a just a genius idea I've worked as a casting consultant a talent agent I've been as I've been talent I've been in all of those seats as well and just it's such a genius idea that streamlined so many systems and saved so much time it's it's brilliant I love that that you really saw that and, and delve deep into the tech world even when tech wasn't your thing because that can be absolutely frightening as well 
very much harder than, I mean, this is like 10 years ago. There was no online resources. There was no startup communities. There was nowhere to go and find, you know, information. Oh God, it's probably longer than that. You know, so it was really like literally going online, Googling for development companies. Um, it was wild. So you started Wink around 21. Is that right? Yeah. So to start a business of your own around that age, you sort of need to have those entrepreneurial passions within you. Were you always like that as a child? Look, I think my parents would tell you I was just very stubborn. That's good I... news because I have a very stubborn child. I, I hope she's going to be <laughs> oh, I, no, I, I wish that she is uh, less stubborn than I was. I, d I don't think I came good until I was about, you know, late 20s, early 30s. I was, oh. yeah, I was very, um, I had a very clear vision of where I was going and what I was doing and I took no prisoners. So yeah, look, I think I probably didn't know. We we moved a lot uh, when I was growing up. We traveled and lived overseas. And I think that taught me to be quite adaptable, but it also exposed me to a lot of people who were doing, I guess, less conventional careers. And then in my late teens, early 20s, a lot of my friends were small business owners. Like we we certainly didn't talk about them as as entrepreneurs back then, but you know, they owned restaurants or they um, might have owned an advertising agency. They were all sort of doing their own thing. And so I didn't have, I guess, a great deal of friends who were working nine to five. Uh, obviously, a lot of my friends were models as well or photographers or creative directors. So it didn't seem like such a big deal. And I didn't have a nine to five job that I had to, you know, bite the bullet and go and quit. But I look back on it now and think, God, like if I'd known how challenging it was going to be. And if I'd known, I guess, all of the things that come with starting a business and scaling businesses, it's hard to know whether or not you would take that step. Yeah. You you um, choose not to work a 40 hour week so that you can work a 400 hour week. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Correct. And not take holidays for 15 years, you know. Did you have little businesses when you were growing up as a kid? No, I didn't. I was, I was really academic. I guess I had a lot of um, passions and hobbies. Like I learned to fly a plane when I was 15. I was just like, I need to get my pilot's license. That seems really important. I'm going to travel a lot for work. So it'd be really a good idea to have my pilot's license. Like just dumb things like that. So have you, have you got your pilot's license? I stopped flying, oh God, probably about 15 years ago. You have to maintain a minimum number of hours um, every year to keep your license. Unfortunately in Sydney, that's really hard to do. You have to, yeah go out and carve out time to do that. So. Oh, you're incredible. I love that for you. And what did your parents say when you were like, okay, guys, can I get my pilot's license at 15? They were like, look, we will drive you there. You can save up your waitressing money from your cafe job and we will drive you there. But, you know, this is on you. You're paying for it. You need to make sure you work your studies around pursuing this. And yeah, I look back and I think, God, they they humored me for on a lot of crazy ideas like that. Oh, sometimes you need that. Sometimes you need that yep. person to humor you and, and believe in your own ideas as well. Just a little bit of crazy like you. Running your own business, starting your own companies, exiting your own companies, getting funding, it, I'm sure all comes with a lot of pressure and a lot of stress. So I'm curious to know how you deal with those moments. Are you someone who gets easily stressed and and what are, what are the tools in your kit that you use to sort of keep well around it? I've just started wearing an aura ring, which is very confronting for anyone who wears one or has used one. I thought I was pretty good at dealing with stress. I have probably lived under an enormous amount of stress and pressure for, yeah, 18 years. I'm running multiple businesses concurrently and, yeah, raising capital, exiting two businesses. You know, I've sort of, yeah, been, been through a lot, I guess. And I thought that I was probably just quite acclimatized to it, but um, your aura ring tells you your heart rate variability and mine is absolutely appalling. It says that I've been in flight or fight for a very, very long time and I really need to work on that and change that. It's obviously terrible for your long-term health. So look, I thought I was probably good at it. Maybe I'm not. Certain things I do, I think, to help me cope. Um, one is obviously having great people around me, both an amazing team in my businesses who understand now how I operate. I'm pretty transparent with them about... Um, you know, the, the processes of the business. I give in all of my businesses, I give my teams full PL transparency. I think the only way people can help you and get behind you and believe in your ideas is if they really understand what the business needs to achieve, how it's tracking, how it's performing, what the capabilities 
KPIs are that we need to hit. So I have amazing teams around me who take a lot of the sort of day-to-day pressure off. And then I have amazing mentors who are really good at calling me on my bullshit as well. And will say like, hey, I can see some, you know, repeat behaviors going on here. Or, you know, I think this is coming from a place of fear. I think you're reacting that way because you feel out of control. I have amazing counselors. So I have a naturopath that I work with. I have a counselor and psychologist that I work with. Um, At different times in my life, I've had a whole suite of other things. I have an amazing acupuncturist that I see once a week who sometimes I'm like, I can't tell if it's the acupuncture or if it's the fact that I go there and lay in a quiet room and I can't move or touch anything for 45 minutes because I'm covered in needles. And then I do make sure I carve out time every day to exercise or train um, where it's the, the one thing that's just for me and You know, I can't be bothered by emails or WhatsApps or calls or crises. So does it always work? No, I definitely have had periods in my life where I've been completely burnt out and gone, I can't do this anymore. All the toys out of the pram, you know, I have a a big tantrum and go, I just can't do this. It's too much, you know, the the full meltdown. Um, And I think uh, fortunately or unfortunately as a business owner, there's sort of no one else there. Like the the buck stops with you. So uh, there isn't, you know, you don't get to quit and, you know, go call in sick or take four weeks off and go, I can't do this anymore. I'm stressed. Take sick leave, you know, stress leave. Um, you just kind of have to back up and, and get back up and do it again. So do I always cope? No. Um, I think you just get more and more, um, I guess, resilient over time um, and probably also get better at, at identifying what really is super, super important or a crisis or what is, you know, a tempest in a teacup and likely to blow over. It's important that we highlight that it's not always easy, I think, too, because when people can look at you from the outside and say, wow, look at all these amazing, successful businesses that you've created. And, you know, you're an absolute go-getter and you're so incredibly talented at all of these amazing things. It looks like a shiny lifestyle, but then it hasn't been without grit and struggle and hustle and fails and they only, yeah, people only see the highlight reel. And I talk about it a lot because I do think it's important, um, especially from a mental health perspective, people do only see like the awards or yeah, the successful exits or that they don't see the, I always say, you know, no one sees on Instagram the nine or 10 hours a day I spend typing at my laptop. Like that's not super exciting content, you know, mm. <laughs> they do see the the fun parties or yeah, the great awards or the new feature launches, but they don't get to see the day in, day out, you know fights with your partner because you've had to miss another, you know, dinner with family or, you know, missing your best friend's birthday or, you know, having to cancel on holidays because you've had some crisis at work come up. They just don't get to see those things. So do you you feel like you've had a lot of those moments in your life where you've had to give up certain other things to get the success you have in business like you do now? Absolutely. Like I think, um, especially when I was selling the right fit and the influencers agency, there was probably an 18 month period where I was really honest and transparent with people. um, And I just said, look, this is, you know, one of the biggest transactions I will have to do in my life. And for this period of time, it is my sole key focus. I need to, obviously it shouldn't have taken that long, but um, it was a process of, you know, preparing the business for sale, taking it to market and then dealing with a negotiation process over sort of about a six month period. So I was like, look, I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm not going to be available. I'm going to be super honest that um, I'm probably not going to reply to your text messages. And there's going to be things that I just simply can't do, but I need to get through this. And I recognize that for myself, the things that I can do are exercise, take care of my health, try and get as much sleep as I can and deal with this one big chunky project. And that's all I've got the capacity for. So I I just was very honest with friends and family and said, I will absolutely, you know, do my best to respond where I can, but pretty much count me out for the next 12 months. I'll be, I've just got to get through this. And I'm really, really sorry, but that's, that's sort of the most important thing to me. Um, and I've only got capacity. I'm only one person. I can only do so much. I love that you warned them, so to speak. I love that you, you called yourself out and yeah. you this is, this is what's happening. And, and they weren't left wondering as to why you weren't replying, why you weren't involved, why you weren't present with them. And I think, yeah, there's those big moments in our, like in our lives, those, those life defining moments in our careers that take that type of dedication and razor focus that, yeah. that it needs. I, I had uh, Radic Sali on the podcast, XC of Swiss, he's written an amazing book. Uh, and he talks about, you know, completely 
in not drinking alcohol in the lead up to things, the big deals and big events within business as well, just so his mental clarity is as sharp as it can possibly be and making sure that he's meditating a lot during the lead up and, and being completely grounded and focused and controlling the controllables, which is something that's really important. And I also spent a lot of time um, deciding what I could take off my plate. And so I went through and went, what can I outsource like anything that I possibly could I outsourced you know from meal deliveries obviously like having my cleaner come more regularly anything that I could possibly go I just don't for the next 12 months I don't want to think about it there's sometimes where throwing money at a problem really can work and I was like I'm just taking all of this off my plate and what could I proactively get in front of so I went through and looked at okay what can I pre-order now like birthday gifts for my mom, all of these things that I could schedule and just go done, dusted. I don't need to think about it for 12 months. Like just mm. taking that guilt off of myself and going, this is what I can do during this period of time. And that's okay. Yeah. Great. Taking a quick minute to interrupt this conversation to let you know about something exciting I am growing. As you might know, I'm incredibly passionate about helping people to find and share their voice, especially if their voice is one that aims to create positive change in others. And I've launched a podcast network with purpose. It's called the Guide Your Light Network that features podcasts and voices that inspire, educate, and transform listeners. And we have a library of podcasts that are part of our network that truly embody that mission, and we're looking for more. If this has sparked interest in you and you are ready to start exploring speaking and using your voice in this way, I'd love for you to check it out. Also, if you have something important to say and you don't know where to start to bring that to life, we can also help you to craft your authentic message through our Guide Your Light online sessions to help you get super clear on your intention, messaging and structure needed to launch a podcast of your own that is authentically you. Just head over to guideyourlightnetwork.com. Now, I love that you imp implemented a well-being team, so to speak. So you're like, you're getting all your things done and, and you can actually schedule that time in your calendar. I'm with my acupuncturist for the next two hours. I am here, blah, 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 blah. But people listening who might not have the funds to do all of those extensive um, complementary therapies or whatever it is. I mean, because these things can get expensive. I'd be doing them weekly, unfortunately. I'd love to do all of that stuff on a day-to-day -day basis and get beautiful long massages if we could, but it gets expensive. If there was one thing that you would say that you use to really ground you that doesn't cost the earth, what would that, what would that be? For me, it would be reading every night. So it's obviously super low cost. I buy paperback books. There's no technology in the bedroom. And it gives me that break between, I'll be honest, you know, I work until quite late. I often eat my dinner at my desk, but it gives me that break between, okay, end of the day, time to go to sleep. I get into bed and I read something that I try not to read business books. I do love biographies, but, but it gives me something to just go, I'm doing something for myself that nourishes me, nourishes my soul and gives me a separation between all of the chaos that was the day and going into sleep and, and resetting for the next day. So I'm not a meditator. I have tried many times, but um, highly recommend it for those who can stick to it. And the other thing that I really love and, and will never negotiate on is newspapers in the sunshine on the weekend. I buy hard copy newspapers, I block out time by myself and I will sit in the sun and I read the newspapers and it's just a no distraction time. And it just, it's probably the one time during the week that I really just give myself to process. I'm thinking about things while I'm reading, having a cup of coffee and no distractions, bit of vitamin D on the skin really yes. make a world of difference. There's something that really brings us back to touching paper, doesn't it? I was having this conversation yeah. with my sister a couple of weeks ago and she had she was up here visiting and she brought her Kindle along and she was reading reading a book off her Kindle and I'm sitting next to her reading a book off reading a paperback book and she said, you've got to get one of these. It's so good. And I said, all right, let's go through the pros and cons. And she li literally listed 50 pros that were beating the paperback every single time, the convenience, the cost. The, all, all of it, the comfort, all of it. And I'm like, I can't. I need, I'm on a screen so much that I really need to not be on a screen when I'm reading. And it's just that escape from any distractions or just, the, I know the screens are different, but it's just for me, 
I'm like you, I think I just need to touch paper and just draw back to that, that simplicity of life. Yeah. Everyone laughs with my obsession with the newspapers on the weekend and going out and physically buying them and physically taking them with me and sitting down places. But I just love it. There's just something so tangible about that experience and working your way through something and then having it completed. And I love it. Yeah. Well, you are a tech technology minded person now because you've built all of these amazing tech companies there's obviously huge tech advances going on in the world right now with artificial intelligence ai across so many different industries i've been talking about this a lot it's i'm intrigued by the whole ai world and and where it's actually going to take us i'm a bit of an optimist but i'm seeing a lot of <laughs> potential downfalls as a result of this and lots of industries being affected. So I'd love to get your take on where you sort of sit in in this realm if you're using AI in your businesses and how you and how you're sort of positioning yourself with it so that you know you you're maximizing the capabilities of it but not letting it take over your world. Such a great question and I have been grappling with this myself. I've been reading a lot. I just um I read Mo Gowat's book um which I have to look up the title for you later. Um but he was the head of AI at Google and left at DeepMind, left to go and work independently because he was sort of concerned about some of the futures of AI. I've also seen Tristan Harris um, speak when I was at a conference in the US um, who was in the movie, uh, the Facebook movie about, you know, some of the concerns mm -hmm. about technology and AI. And he speaks about the grave concerns they have about AI and, and gave some really terrifying use case scenarios that I had just never thought of. They're using AI to scan MRIs of, of brain patterns and um, thought patterns, and then they're able to use those to determine what you're thinking and how you feel about particular topics. Yeah. So there's Honestly, a whole every day I hear something new that just blows me yeah, up. I'm like, wow, here I was just thinking, oh, it's quite handy for like you know, content creation and, you know, reducing the cost of making short form videos and stuff. No, there's whole other use cases that like I was not across. So in some ways, I think potentially I'd been living in this sort of like blissful naivety of, you know, all, thinking about all the positives. And I do think there's definitely some riskier use cases. Obviously, I think it's far too late. You can't put the genie back in the bottle, right? Like we are, we're here. It's, we, we need to embrace this um, for across all of my businesses. Yes, we are dabbling in AI in some really basic ways, you know, just how we organize our workflows and meeting, recording, note taking and things like that, which have been, you know, really efficient and really helpful. How we use it in the products that I build, definitely like we're improving our matching algorithms in Hash Gifted using AI. So there's some really exciting things that you can build at a really low cost now because of AI, which is really exciting. I do think it will long-term be jobs accretive. Like I do think that we're going to see there's going to be this weird in-between phase where, you know, we have all these graphic designers out of work or, you know, people always say, well, what about models? Like, aren't we just going to have AI models? Maybe, I don't know. You know so there's probably going to be very clear disruption in particular industries. But I do think long-term we're going to see more and more jobs created on the back of AI and they're just going to be different types of jobs. So I do think probably the one thing is um, the pain of staying up to date and trying to get across all of these new tools. Um, they're, they're obviously being launched at such an a incredible rate and the technology it's itself is just changing you know, exponentially. When I saw Sora come out, you know, the OpenAI's video creation tool, I was just like, my God, this is mind boggling. Like the, the level of sophistication now in uh, in making video content and uh, was just mind boggling. So it's just every single day, there feels like a new thing that, you know, you need to get across and, and stay up to date with. Um, and I'm trying to, to not feel overwhelmed by that. I'm trying to feel positive about it and that it's exciting, but to be honest, some days it does go on the long list of, you know, stuff to do that you need to keep on top of um, and can feel super overwhelming. Definitely can feel overwhelming. I'm, I own a podcast network and I've just done a full report on, you know, mainly for myself to know, but shared it with everyone. It's like, okay, what are the main things that are yeah. going on here? And you just see so many industries being potentially wiped out by what is going on. And I, I think, you know, it, you can sit on the fear wagon of, of this. Uh, but I think knowledge is power. And so if we equip ourselves with as much knowledge that we need, um, and like you said, it's it's very rapid, so you probably won't know everything all the time, but just sort of stay on top of it. I think that's probably the best case scenario that we can be in. But it sort of really links back to, you know, us wanting to touch paper. I think it, I do agree with you. It goes, It's going to go full circle and people are going to be like, actually, I want 
realness. I want authenticity. I think people are already at this stage of the world is uh, we're craving authenticity, but give us another two to five years. We're going to, we're not going to know what is actually real and what isn't. And we're going to be craving more in-person things. I was chatting to my mom earlier. I was like, what industry do you think is not going to be affected by AI? You know, maybe food. And she's like, oh, food could be like, they could just give you genetically modified meals or whatever it is. And um, people still need to taste and they're going to want to draw back to those real moments of the human experience because ultimately we are here to experience that, aren't we? Absolutely. And I think it's been so interesting that all of the jobs I think that we had probably, you know, if we dreamed of a future state, all of the things that we didn't want to be doing and that we wanted robots to replace for, for us are all of the things that we're kind of being left doing now, you know, like, there isn't anyone stacking the dishwasher, like that's still us, but like all of the great creative jobs, script writing, you know, content creation, they're kind of the ones that are being replaced by AI. So I just think it's such an interesting process that the things we've sort of focused on using AI to do are not the things that I think any of, any of us would have said like, God, I would, I'd love more time to spend with my family, not doing chores and washing or, you know, yeah. It's so I just think it's a really interesting sort of development. Mm, same. What piece of advice would you give a business owner at the moment if they're um, worried about AI? I think definitely to, yeah, as you were sort of saying, like get off the fear train because the businesses that will be most impacted by AI are the ones that put their heads in the sand and try and pretend it's not existing. It is going to touch every single industry and every single element of work. And so I think you don't need to know absolutely everything about AI. You don't need to be an expert, but you do need to have a general understanding of what the opportunities are and what the threats are and how you might be able to navigate that as a business owner. So there's so many great newsletters out there. And, you know, the, over the last 10 years, the democratization of content is, you know, one of the most powerful things. There's so many free online courses. There's so many great access to YouTube clips or yeah, newsletters that you can subscribe to. So I think just bite the bullet and carve out blue sky time, you know, once a week to go and explore how it might be beneficial for your business. Yeah, that's a really great idea. We are definitely content overloaded. <laughs> that's for sure as well. I've um, I've taken the week off social media. I've got maybe five Instagram pages. I've got LinkedIn page. I've got that many. And I'm, I've got a I've got a small team that works with me, but I'm doing predominantly a lot of the tech stuff still, the technical stuff still. And, you know, I, I love variation too. So I've got a lot of different projects going on. And I think end of last week, I was just like, okay, I'm shaking because I don't even know where I'm going next. Like I just needed to not have the input filter into my, I needed no new information to come into my brain. And so oh, I've God. spent this week off it and it's just been so relaxing and, and it's stress-free it's just been like oh I'm just sitting within myself I'm more aware of things I'm being present so I think it's important for us to take those moments like I said there's, there's so much good in social media and there's so much that we can use it for to benefit ourselves and our businesses but it's also great to have those moments where you just completely disconnect I wouldn't agree more and I think having that self-awareness to go how is this tool making me feel like is this bringing me joy or is it something that's making me feel more stressed more overwhelmed something else I need to do in which case I mean if you absolutely need it for work and you absolutely cannot get rid of it uh, well okay but otherwise why opt in to bring additional stress into your life you know <laughs> I think just taking a time out is like such a great idea you know having that self-awareness to go you know what like this is this is not making me feel great and and I'm going to elect out for a week and and give myself some breathing room. Yeah, agreed. Well, I've got these conversation cards here and I want to get to know you a little bit more. We created these a while ago. They're called um, converse, Conscious Conversation Starters and uh, that, that business doesn't exist anymore, but I've still got these sitting on my desk and every now and then I'm quite podcast interviews I'm like you know what I really want to know more about you and, and you're obviously you're an incredible business mind but I, I want to know about the person behind the business mind and, and what drives you and excites you so I'm just going to pull some random questions out and the first one I've just picked up here is I like this question because I, I like to see what fuels people what motivates you what makes you wake up every morning and go let's go let's do this again and smash it what is that fueling behind what you do you know what? I've spent such a long time digging into this with with both professional counsellors and psychologists and my mentors to go like what created like this human that you are like <laughs> a lot of people have you know they had a 
terrible relationship with their father who never, you know, acknowledged them unless they were winning school awards or whatever. I didn't have this sort of any core driving um, trauma or underlying belief that, you know, I wasn't good enough or that I um, like a scarcity mindset, like I need lots of money, otherwise I'm going to. So what drives me underneath it all? I'm still still do not know. I derive, I think, out of it every single day is this joy of problem solving. Knowing that, I suppose it's probably a little single, little test every single day of like, hmm, I just applied myself to something that I wasn't sure if I could solve, but, and I'm a little bit outside of my comfort zone and you're not always going to get it right. There's going to be times where you totally sucked at something and, you know, you tried it and that didn't work and you're like, okay, some lessons learned there. But I think it's always just that little bit of overextending myself and going, okay, you know, this is a new challenge. You know, I haven't sold a business before or I haven't, you know, the first time you raise capital, the first time, you know, the first time you do something you're like. So I think it's probably that problem solving and I guess self-development learning, always just being on the cusp of where my comfort zone is. I love that so much. What do you want to be remembered for? Ooh. Huge question. Yeah. Funnily enough, I, I sadly had a friend um, pass away in the Bondi Junction um, attacks recently, and uh, it's actually sort of prompted a, a, my close friendship group to, to actually talk a lot about these things, like, you know, what, if you were to write your eulogy and, and who would be there and what do you want to be, be remembered for? So it's sort of been something that's very front of mind because I've certainly in the last 10 years really over-indexed on work and that being my sort of core focus and driver and the one thing that I couldn't uh, everything else had to sort of come second, couldn't be accommodated for. And so I have actually been reflecting a lot about this and, and one, getting a bit more balance in my life, but two, what people would say and how confronting that is. You know, do you want people to say like, gosh, she was incredibly driven and she was an amazing business person? Like probably not. Like it's probably not the things that I would want to be the first thing that that rolls off her tongue. You know, I'd like it to be that that I was really kind and that I, you know, was there for other people and, and that I was a good friend. And um, so, yeah, I think it's it's probably for me over the last, you know, two and a half weeks been a realisation that maybe the first things that I would be remembered for now are probably not the things that would be my ideal top five words that people would would use to describe me. So I think there's a bit of a self journey piece of work to do there. Such a powerful journaling exercise. Like you said, I did that very early on in my personal development journey myself. And it really makes you stand back and and have a holistic view of your life and what decisions you're making. And obviously we have our values at the core of who we are, but it really makes you identify those and not waver from them, I think too. So we've got a clear vision in your mind of this is the type of person that I really want to be. And these are the things that I'm not going to adapt to away from these are my five values and it's so important to know that so yeah if anyone's listening go off and do that if you've never done that before it's it's an amazing exercise to really dig deep into who you are and I just want to you know touch on the loss of your beautiful friend and and say how sorry I am it's just a horrific thing to have happened and um you know such a shock for so many people so I'm really sorry that um she was someone so close to you touch so many people I think and one silver lining out of such an awful awful situation is that I do think it took so many people uh, that gave them that opportunity to sort of take stock and go am I living the life that I want to live am I being the person that I want to be um, how am I showing up for the people around me you know because it really can be gone all in a second and so yeah it's a, a absolutely awful awful way to to arrive at you know those conclusions but um yeah, if, if there's one sort of silver lining in it, I think hopefully it all gives us that sort of reminder. Mm, absolutely. Taryn, what are you most proud of? Oh, great question. I think now I'm probably most proud of the amazing sort of connections and network sounds like a really awful kind of way to describe it. But a lot of my time, both in my career and personally, knowingly or unknowingly, really tried to overextend myself on investing in people. Um, where I see even now, you know, making new friends and you think, you know, this person's really my person. I really like, oh, I really like them. I really want to invest in that relationship. And that's been the case, you know, across a whole different sort of touch point, whether it's mentors or um, friends or colleagues or mentees. 
really sort of overextended myself in those and made time for it even when I didn't have time. And so probably now I'm most proud that I have an incredible um, diverse network of people that I deeply, deeply care about and that I deeply admire and who hopefully in in some way feel similar um, about me. So yeah, I think that's that's probably what I'm most proud of. I love that answer. And it's, you know, you, you sound like you've created your own little family or a unit of connections that really inspire you and, and see you and make you feel valued as well. I think it's so important. Can I ask you one more? What do you like most about yourself? Oh, Gosh, great question. And something we probably don't ask ourselves often enough, is it? Probably, uh, you know, you. I think you grapple with who you are in the world a lot, um, you know, as you go through, yeah, I'm in my late thirties now. Probably the, the uniqueness and quirkiness of my mind. I think, you know, there's certainly pros and cons of that. And I think they've shown up in different ways in my life over the years. And I think now I'm kind of at peace and acknowledge the, the parts of my, my, brain and mind and ways of working that every good part has a shadow side, right? And I think um, I've sort of come to terms with the really, really great parts of me have a shadow side and I can manage those and that I really am proud of, I guess, holistically my brain and my quirky mind um, and how it sort of works and the opportunities it's given me over the years. What a beautiful answer. All right. Now I ask everyone this question on the show based off the the title of the podcast, Things You Can't Unhear. So what was one thing in your life uh, could be valuable advice or just a, a bit of an aha moment, something you read or somewhat surpassing comment it could have even been that really stopped you in your tracks, made you see things differently? Oh, look, I'd probably say, I, I wish I could remember the person that that had said this to me, but I was going through, you know, another work drama. I can't remember what it was now, but um, they'd said to me, don't waste time rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. And it was such a great like aha moment for me in that there's situations that you can't unfuck and don't spend, you know, good money or time throwing it after bad. You know, you just sometimes need to go, this didn't work, whether it was a key hire, whether it was a business, whether it was a, you know, go to market strategy, a relationship, whatever it might be, just sometimes you need to put your ego aside and go, you know what, this one hasn't worked and that's okay and park it and yeah, not spend time rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Mm, valuable information. Taryn, your your mind is something I'm proud of too. I'm re- I really oh. enjoyed <laughs> I really enjoyed this conversation uh, and I feel like there's so many different elements to you that I could continue to talk to you about. Like I said, you, your mindset is is quite fascinating and obviously the business side of it as well, but also, you know, your unique personal side of that mindset too, which is fascinating. I can't wait to see what's next. Hope hashtag, it's hash gifted, isn't it? The new new brand that you're working on. I've just literally flicked that out to a few of my my friends who have brands and are trying to get their name out there. So it's it's such an innovative idea and I hope it, and I'm sure it will go as well as all of the other businesses that you work on. But thank you so much for sharing your wisdom today and sharing who you are at, at the core of it. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I really, really enjoyed this. Thanks for listening to the show. What did you think? And what did you feel? Let us know by leaving me a message on the Things You Can't Unhear Instagram community page. And if you can, give us some ratings love on your favorite listening platform. 